Yeah, and if you want to mix things up, you can keep it simple in other ways. Like there's the sushi burrito place where they only serve one thing, but it's a sushi burrito. That's interesting. Great. But don't do sushi and burrito. <laughs> yes, please. Please don't. Gross. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined as ever by my co-host, Rodney Evans. Hello, Aaron, and everyone else. On today's episode, we're going to talk about even overstatements, a form of strategy and prioritization. But before we prioritize that, let's emphasize a check-in round. Okay, let's do it. As we will all learn, if we don't already know it, even overs are used for making trade-offs. So we're going to do a check-in round question that's related. And that is this. What is a difficult trade-off that you have made? And uh, did it pan out for you? Yeah. I mean, I think probably in my personal life, the biggest recent trade-off was deciding to move from New York to Colorado, Mm -hmm. which was all about uh, prioritizing sanity and being close to family for my son, uh, who is the grandson to many people who live in Colorado. And just like being, yeah, being closer to a support structure, even over being in the hustle and bustle of it all of like the world's biggest city and, and kind of prioritizing, frankly, prioritizing networking above everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think it worked out so far. I wasn't sure if it would like, if I would be able to, you know, stay, fully in business and connected to the world, but it was working fine even before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic happened, it was like, no, really, the world wants this to work for you. <laughs> like this, yeah. is, this is not a problem. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. I, I, a lot of these pop into my brain, but there's one that I, I think because my best friend is here and we're talking a lot about her moving and, and so I'm thinking a lot about real estate at the moment. So mm-hmm. when, when we moved to Durham from Manhattan, we were renting because we didn't know what we were doing. And then when we started looking at houses here in Durham, we really wanted to be walking distance to all of the things because yep. you know, we're city people and it's a big adjustment, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, <laughs> then we fell in love with this neighborhood that is not a walking distance neighborhood. And I found my dream house. It was like everything I ever wanted in a house. It was like mid-century with like built-in cherry, like bank hats and a sunken (laughs) living room and a Japanese rock garden. It had it like a music studio off the garage. It was just like the house that was made for me in 1965 and then just preserved perfectly waiting for you. And it was like, it was exactly what we wanted to spend. I mean, it was like, it was everything, but it wasn't walking distance. And we had an even over that was really like walk to the things even over other stuff we want a lot of other stuff there were a lot of other things on the other side of that even over and so we did not buy that house and we built a house in the neighborhood that we wanted and I really like haven't looked back I it was totally the right thing but if I had not had that very clear trade-off in my head I think that I probably would have revisited that decision a lot of times it's Especially funny. if we had ended up like not actually walking or not actually engaging, but we use those things every single day of our lives. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I actually think house hunting and apartment shopping are probably the first place in life where people really play the trade-offs yes, game totally. in a meaningful way. Yeah. And so it's it's like the best place to start the lesson about right. even overs in some way, right? Which is just like you can't have all the stuff. Can't have everything. Right. So what are you going to choose and how will you make that sort of guide your decisioning? Yeah. And it's a place where like even, I think there are other places in this life and we'll talk more about this where if you have enough resources or you have enough time or you have enough money, maybe you don't have to make the same kind of trade off. Mm. But with real estate, a lot of times it doesn't matter. Like you have to make a trade off because you just usually can't get everything that you want in the exact place (laughs) at the time that you want a house. Like it's just so unlikely. Yeah. And even if you do have unlimited funding, if you're, you know, Jeff Bezos buying his 10th home, you still have to make choices, right? You can't be by the beach and by the downtown and you can't be like simultaneously, right? You have to, you have to pick, do you want to be nearer to this or nearer to that? Do you want it to be taller or shorter, older or newer? So yeah, there's something to it. Nice. Got to pick. So we are already starting to dive into even overs, which is so much fun to do. And 
I feel like this is one of those things, uh, one of those tools or tactics that we use that once you sort of see the world through the lens of even overstatements, it's very difficult to unsee it and, and apply it to everything. So, so let's talk a little bit about even overstatements, maybe just ground us in where they came from, uh, as far as we know, and what are they and how do we use them? <laughs> yeah. So it's funny, I've had trouble with the provenance of this one, but what I do know is that the Agile Manifesto, which is a couple decades old, has overstatements in it, right? Mm -hmm. So like working software over comprehensive documentation or customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And at the bottom of these four Agile Manifesto overstatements, there's a little note that says, that is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. Mm -hmm. And so they're basically just saying, like, we're not trying to shit on the stuff on the right. We're just saying if we have to choose, we're going to we're going to push for the stuff on the left. And and more recently, you know, we've seen the same idea brought to life in the even overstatement, which I had introduced to me by former guest Tom Thomason, mm -hmm. one of the you know kind of early players in the holacracy space and, you know, co-founders. And so I think that the even over phrasing may have come from the you know holacracy one folks or maybe they borrowed it from someone else but there's not a clear trail there's not a clear set of breadcrumbs on the internet that goes back any further than that so we know that prioritization has been happening for a long time we know that overstatements have been around i like the even because it puts the little line at the bottom of the agile manifesto right into the statement instead mm -hmm. of having to say well we value this even though, even over that you can just say i like this even over this other right. thing and it sort of suggests that you care about both or that both are valid and important. So yeah, so that's as much as, as I know, at least about the history. If any listeners, you know, can write in or call in and let us know more, that'd be awesome. But what we do know is that their usefulness is, is quite profound. So in most business environments that I've been in, I'm sure you will agree, there's a little bit of we can have it all Yes. you know, madness going on where it's like, oh, yeah, we're going to have growth and margin and revenue growth and people are going to work a 40 hour week and we're going to, you know, all sing Kumbaya and everything's going to work great. We're going to do more software of higher quality to more customers all the time. And that is something that I think happens because of the pressures and, and the challenges of just a growth even over everything culture. But the reality is that there are always trade-offs, right? Mm -hmm. Theories of constraints apply, physics applies, and we do have to make choices. And what's nice about the even overstatement as an, as an asset is if we as a team come up with it, if we you know, work on how to express it, if we understand it together and then we consent to it, we have a thing that will help us make a thousand other decisions over the course of the next many months or years guided by this trade-off that we've already made explicit, which mm -hmm. is like, hey, if we can't have everything... We're going to prioritize this thing over that thing. And I think that's it. It's really about clarity of those trade-offs. It's about knowing when you're veering away from that intentionally. And it's such a simple thing. You know, it's it's the time to sit down and write some statements on post-it notes that can transform your ability to execute a strategy and your ability to empower and to, you know, steer autonomously and all that. So I think that's the that's the preamble as I know it. Yeah. And what happens in our work a lot is, particularly at the executive level, you get a lot of the guidance or you hear a lot of the guidance of like, it's both and. And just like in the real estate example, even if you are <laughs> fortunate enough to be in a position where you can just add resources to a team, or you can just throw money at the problem or whatever, there are always constraints. It, the world mm -hmm. is not just both and when it comes to production of anything, yeah. or it comes to outcome of anything. There is cognitive load, there's energetic load, there is complexity that's added by continuing to add. And so if you happen to be one of the people who's listening to this preamble and being like, we don't have to make those trade-offs because we're wildly successful and unconstrained, you are lying to yourself. Like we all <laughs> lie to ourselves, like I, how I can't have that mid-century house on the small corner lot that we actually ended up living in. And that is the nature of trade-offs. And, and the smarter we are about making them, the sooner we can get out of both and or either or and do this work instead. I also think it's worth stating just right out of the gate that more is not always better. So true. And so one of the best things about even overstatements is saying like, when we think about strategy, when we think about behavior and we think about how we show up and how we team, like saying we can have it all is a cop out A, because it's not true, but B, 
it's not it's not necessarily better to be everything to be all things to all people a lot of what a brand and a strategy is about is about setting out territory that's like only your territory and saying like this is the way we're going to play we're going to be different and the way we're going to be different is we're going to prioritize something even over what everyone else thinks is cool. And so that is, that's a big part of it to me too, is like, sometimes it feels like you're making me choose and there's loss aversion, but I think, no, 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 it's competitively intelligent to be like, while everyone else's books are thick, ours are thin, not because we can't be thick, but because we choose not to be. Literally, Ed will not enter a restaurant where he thinks that the menu is too big. Because exactly. like he he's a the trained chef factory. and he looks at a menu that's four <laughs> pages long and he just goes like no they don't know what they're doing because <laughs> no. nobody can do everything essentially well and that's so right. rather than kidding ourselves to say like we're a diner and a Korean place and tacos too it's like no be the thin book <laughs> that like does breakfast burritos better than anybody else. Right. And if you, yeah. And if you want to mix things up, you can keep it simple in other ways. Like there's the sushi burrito place where they only serve one thing, but it's a sushi burrito. That's interesting, but don't do sushi and burrito. (laughs) Yes, please, please don't. Gross. (laughs) So, So before we talk about where we would use even overstatements, let's talk about some good ones, uh, that we've seen and used so that everybody's got a shared mental model. So Aaron, hit me with the highlight reel, even overstatements. <laughs> so the one I always harp on in workshops is market share, even over margin as, as a kind of implicit Amazon strategy, because both are fun, love to make profit, love to have market share, have to pick whether we're going to spend our free cash flow on growing the number of people that use our stuff or whether we're going to pocket it. And the other statement works too. Like there are definitely companies that are in a profit mode where they're like, we don't need to get any bigger. We just need to like be profitable and execute well. So I like that one as an example. Another one that's pretty common, particularly in software development, is quality even over kind of volume, like how much Mm -hmm. we're shipping. And so do you want to have really high quality stuff or do you want to have stuff that's updating and adapting and changing all the time and push, push, push? And, you know, you could you can debate which way to put that statement. It's also another good example of how these things intersect. So if you have an agile approach and you have a really tight feedback loop, you might be able to focus on amount of ships and actually get quality, but you might not. It might turn out that you just can't wrangle that and you have to prioritize it the other way. So I like that one. I like sustainability, even over maybe like short term growth or profitability. Mm -hmm. So you could like burn all your bridges and sell a bunch of stuff to people that don't need it and then have to kind of flee town, uh, the the Ponzi scheme approach. Or you could be like, no, we're in it for the, you know 20 years, 100 years. And so you make very different decisions in service of that kind of sustainability or even literal, you know, ecological sustainability, even over profit or even over, you know, convenience where you're just like, yeah, we're going to have a lead certified building and it's going to be more expensive and it's going to take longer to build. And that's just the trade off we're going to make. So mm-hmm. I don't know. That's that's a few right off the top of the noggin. Yeah. I also have seen a bunch that are very literally about prioritizing like one product over another or one class of products over another. So I, you know, we had a client for a long time uh, that you and I both did work with that was really trying to move to becoming a very digital organization. Mm. And they really doubled down trimester after trimester on digital products, even over legacy products. And, and, it, and, and, you know, they, they had to do that so that the funding and the resourcing and the focus and attention would follow. Um, right, and, right. I, and I've worked with other clients where like they picked the one business line that for one quarter they really wanted to invest in and focus on or one customer segment segment yeah. and knew that that would come at the cost potentially of others. The other ones that popped into my mind are, you know, I have some greatest hits around more behavioral stuff like candor even over comfort or Mm -hmm. learning even over executing or, (laughs) you know, feedback even over friendship. Like These are things that, you know, (laughs) the thing that's interesting about even overs is we don't always know that one will come at the cost of the other. Sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. But sometimes just saying out loud the thing that we're afraid we're going to pay with can be really helpful. 
Yeah. So I don't necessarily know that if I give you really critical feedback that you don't want to hear that it's going to impact our friendship. But if that's the reason that I haven't, then it can be helpful for us to articulate out loud and intentionally that even if it costs us some friendship points, we're willing to do it for the sake of honesty. That's interesting. Yeah. And it's funny if you're listening at home, you know, you can play this game. Obviously, we're throwing these off the top of our heads from from many workshops and years doing this. But you can play the game just by looking at a category. So yep. look at something like fast food burgers and grab in and out Burger and McDonald's and hold them up and then say, what are their even overs? Right. Ooh. So like, you know, and so you can look right away and say, all right, well, in and out has a much smaller menu. So clearly mm-hmm. they're prioritizing like simplicity or operational efficiency, even over breadth and and having something for everyone, right? There's no salads. Yeah. It's a yeah. real priority that has real consequences. And so, yeah, you can do that in any category. You look at two restaurants, two movie theaters, two law firms and say like, what are they prioritizing even if they don't know they're doing it? Like even yes. if they're not aware of the trade-offs they're making. Yes, and same inside of a system. Like even if yeah. you're not comparing company to company or restaurant to restaurant or whatever, just go into <laughs> uh, literally anything, go into a house and see like, are they pr- prioritizing cleanliness even over downtime, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. or are they prioritizing design even over comfort? I mean, like yes. you can, you know, yes. just look around in any context and you will see the trade-offs that people have made, even though many are made without a lot of consideration. I had a friend growing up in high school whose mother put the plastic coverings over all the oh, couches. Wow. wow. And I always thought that was that was such an odd even over, right? Because it's like clean couch, even over any usability at Useful all. Useful couch. Like there's no you no <laughs> use of like we're gonna prioritize cleanliness even over the purpose of the item. This to me though is a shitty even over. Because what is the thing that we are really getting from that? I, I think it's, well, it's, it's an, it's an, even over you can disagree with, but what they're getting is the sense that no one's going to ruin their couch. It's the safety of their assets. Okay. So this is an interesting conversation because even when something does not make sense, like it doesn't to us intuitively in this moment, if you usually peel back the onion a little bit, you can find something that is like very essential and very (laughs) human motivation oriented. Right. So like when you said that, I was like, Oh, right. They're prioritizing like prevention of loss, even over enjoyment of usefulness and enjoyment. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, that's a real, like people prioritize scarcity, even over abundance all the time, all the time, because scarcity does get you something, even though if on its face, you're like, Oh, boo, nobody likes that. It's like, no, actually though, like that calms the human nervous system in a certain way. Risk aversion makes us feel maybe comfort. There's always layers to these things, no matter how sort of surface they might appear. And it sort of brings us to rule number one of the even over, which is it should work both ways. And you should be able to get to that, you know, as you peel the end, you should be able to get to that truth. That's like, all right, I could argue this either way. And, and still be right as long as I'm getting something. Right. Whereas a terrible even overstatement will put something that's completely negative and not interesting on the right side. And then you're like, well, that's not a real trade-off at all. That's not a real you trade-off. Know? Right. Yeah. It's like your and my very vastly divergent views on sleep. <laughs> it's like a good, a, a, a compelling even over in my life is not a good night's sleep even over video games. But like, that's a compelling even over in your life. That's right. Yeah. At like, sometimes. Giving up and video games is not a difficult thing for me in order to prioritize sleep, considering I'd rather be sleeping than doing literally anything. Well, so, yeah. And yeah. also, like you said about the layers of the onions, you know, when you peel it away, it's not actually about video games. It's about social connection with old friends. And that's worth staying up late for, you know? But like, Maybe if it was... in your even over. <laughs> not in mine. I'll see them on the weekend. Fair enough. (laughs) So those are some common ones. Aaron's absolutely right. It should not be something great over something terrible that defeats the whole purpose. The other thing that um, you might notice if you think about the examples that we just gave is that often by prioritizing the thing on the left, you ultimately will get the thing on the right. It's just that sometimes it's about sequencing. 
So in the instance where, say, you prioritize candor, even over comfort. And what we mean by that is where you have a team of people, for example, that because they want to maintain the harmony in their relationships, don't tell each other the truth about things. And so if that group of people calls out, okay, for this quarter, we're going to prioritize candor even over this comfort, what you might find at the end of that quarter is that we have a new level of comfort being candid with each other, and it no longer feels like a trade-off. That's a thing that happens a lot. When we prioritize growth even over margin, what we often find at the end of that quarter is that there's less margin pressure. So it's not like one might come at the expense of the other, but often what you find is you do get both. It's the discipline of choosing for a period of time. That's where the magic is. Yeah. My favorite example of this that I think I've mentioned on the show before is Patagonia when they're like, don't buy this jacket. Right. Right? They run that ad and they're just like, our sustainability priority means that we're just going to tell you like, shit, don't buy our stuff anymore. Like put us out of business. And then of course, everybody runs out and buys the jacket because they know it's the most sustainable jacket. And so technically more jackets are made sustainably than they were before the ad was run. They have more sales. The whole thing is very surprising. So there's definitely, (laughs) there's definitely a lot of examples of that. It's a cool inversion. So let's talk a little bit about where these even overstatements fit with some of the other practices we've talked about on this show. So we just very recently did a show on principles. We have talked on this show about the idea of orienting toward outcomes and talking in the past tense versus plans and goals and what might happen. How do you fit even overstatements with some of those other tools or ways of working? Well, I think even overstatements are good at the outset of anything kind of across the different scales. So it certainly fits into, you know, chartering and initiating a project or a team that I think that's a fine place to play this game. And usually that'll be a little bit more behavioral or more about team dynamics, but it doesn't have to be. When you zoom out to like the, you know, the unit level or the business level, I think it kind of connects to essential intent to a large degree. You know, you do the strategy work to figure out roughly where do we want to be or like what's our vector to get, you know, to get towards our purpose. And then you start to ask questions about, well, what what kinds of trade-offs are going to be helpful, potentially unnatural for us, unlikely to happen if we don't make them clear, or just super useful in this moment of trying to pursue this essential intent. And so it is to me kind of coming out of a retrospective, coming out of an essential intent conversation, a great time to just say, is there anything we can make explicit that would help us with the myriad of you know choices and judgments we're going to have to make over the next few years, or even few months for that matter, where, where a statement like this can be useful, or even a debate about a statement like this mm-hmm. can be useful. Like I sometimes find that within the ready, we often end up in similar places with even overs because it's a small business, it's a simple business in its strategy at least. And a lot of the things that we really do prioritize and trade off, we all hold pretty sacred compared to the average. But then what, what it leaves is this like narrow territory for discussion. But I still find it useful, even if we come back to we're going to prioritize, you know, growth even over profitability, or we're going to prioritize, you know, our collective experience even over our individual experience. Again and again, it's the it's the debate, it's the unpacking that's valuable for people to just be like, ah, yeah, I see where everyone else is coming from on this. I see the sides of the trade-off. I see how we play this game. Right. Yeah. And I think a good example of that within the ready, where it was a little bit more controversial, was like, we did some essential intent work a couple of retreats ago where there were some very specific ideas about growth discussed and written down. And I remember you and I getting into like a pretty spirited debate about what (laughs) really the lever for growth is at the ready Mm, and where we came out on it after a lot of toing and froing was like, we get very motivated about growth in terms of attracting new clients when we have members to do the work. Right. And extra members. Yeah. Extra members. When we have capacity that is hungry, we sell work. Then we get hungry. <laughs> and when we have uh, prospective clients who want work and we don't have members ready to go, we 
get less get hungry. passive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get lazy um, because we're like, we're all fed. We're all sleepy. Let's just like let that yeah. one go by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember you and I like having this very um, spirited debate about this thing and basically coming down on the even over of hiring members, even over getting clients because yeah. we know we know from experience and retrospecting and our own patterning now what motivates us collectively and what yeah. doesn't. So if we yeah. all, I, I say this to say, I think about whether you're doing outcomes work, you know, in terms of what you want an organization or a group to be looking like or having achieved at the end of the year, whether you're doing essential intent work that's saying like in a, in a, grounded, but inspirational way. Here's where we'd like to be in a few years, whether you're doing principles work. That's like, if, you know, if this team were perfect, this is what it would do or be whatever those things are. I think of that as like the overarching umbrella intent. And then I think about the even over as like what constrains it so that we know how we're going to go after it. Mm -hmm, So if mm -hmm. our essential intent was something around growth, we got to a point where we were like, okay, what trade-offs would we actually have to make to do that thing? And in our case, that trade-off is have have hungry people. Yeah, pay for them. Yeah, pay for it because then we'll be we'll be on it. We'll be on our game. Yeah, and take the risk. And I think that yeah, it's such a good point too about how even overstatements can evolve as you understand yourself better because clearly we started with a growth even over something yes. agenda. And then when it didn't go quite the way we expected, we were like, let's get into that a little bit. Like, what's going on there? And when you scratch a little deeper and a little deeper, you start to realize like, oh, okay. For us, what's the driver that's going to kind of get us where we need to go? And sometimes these things do need to be threaded where it's like, yeah, growth even over something else, which then daisy chains into, you know, talent capacity even over something else, which then chains into something like, so there could be a nested set of statements that's driving you where you need to go. But yeah, you just kind of have to like take a swing at it and then pay attention and say like, how are we wiggling out of this? Yeah, <laughs> how exactly. And exactly. And I, I think to that point, you know, I, I find people get like a little white knuckle when I talk about doing trade-offs work. Cause they're like, mm-hmm. I don't want to trade off. <laughs> I want to have the things. And certainly I don't want to, you know, there are, there are a fair number of leaders I've worked with over the years who are like, I can't say that we are going to deprioritize something or like, I can't say we're going to make this trade off. And I'm like, well, Maybe you can't say it, but it's happening anyway. It's necessary. And everybody can see it. <laughs> and also, if you don't trade off something explicitly or intentionally, you're going to trade off a whole bunch of things just willy-nilly. Um, and that doesn't tend to go super, super well. Uh, but I, I do think that a lot of the a lot of the juice for the squeeze in in even overs is making the concession that you're gonna make being clear about what the time box is and then really holding yourself as a group to doing it. Like, because you're not going to learn if you picked wrong and you're not going to learn if you made the wrong assessment about your needs or about your reality category or about (laughs) your competitors, unless you fully lean into the thing you said you were going to trade off. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, counterpoint to the resistance is I do find when some teams that I work with finally get to doing this, there is an enthusiasm and a sort of a gleefulness in the leadership to be free to be clear. Yeah. And like, because a lot of it has been like, oh, in order to make everybody happy, I've been playing a game of kind of yes and around everything, keeping it soupy. And then when you're like, no, 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 I need you to say out loud that we prioritize working overtime here because that's the nature of the industry. And if you're not really into that, you shouldn't work here. And they're sort of like, I can say that. And it's like, we can say whatever we want. We can make agreements (laughs) about the truth, you know, and like, let's say it out loud, let's consent to it. And then yeah, if people don't want to play that game, they don't have to play that game. But and if someone has a good counterpoint, you can hear it out. But like, the idea of being free to be clear and real Again, it it does this surfaces that and sometimes it's resistant, but sometimes people are like, oh, thank God, I can just tell the truth. So here's what I actually pri- want to prioritize. Here's what right. I actually care about. Exactly. I, I think that's exactly right. So if a team were wanting to do some of this work, 
how would you tell them to facilitate themselves to getting to some good even overs? I think this is one of those things that, you know, the perfect process has yet to be invented, but there's a few similar processes floating around online and the ready employs, you know, one of them, which is you get a group together, you have some of those other conversations, whether it's, you know, a retrospective or a strategic conversation about essential intent or both or something in between. And then, and then you basically ask the question, what should we prioritize in order to get there in order mm-hmm. to, to, to manifest this and have the group do a lot of generation first. So it's whether it's on post-it notes or on a you know mural board online or wherever you want to do it in a Google doc, we're generating and it's just generate, 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 allow people to just put the numerator up and not know what the denominator is. Cause or it like might be that. like, I know we need to prioritize diversity. Not sure what the trade-off is yet. Like help yeah. me out folks. So get, get as many numerators as you can on there. Get some, you know, get some denominators on there if you can about what's, you know, what's the real trade off. And then, and then, you know, have a discussion to make sure you understand what's on the board. So does anybody see a statement that they don't understand? And I'm, I'm always baffled by how many there are where we're like, oh, wait, what does that, what does that mean exactly? Or the way you phrase that is not super clear, which is a good chance for us to get, you know, in, in the same headspace and then do some kind of voting democracy, you know, elevation of things that seem, super relevant, including putting like with like and and simplifying where we maybe have some patterns. And then ideally someone or a group puts forward a proposal of, hey, I think it's these three or I think it's these four statements that will really guide us for the next X months and see if you can get consent. And and if you can't, then you know you change it, adjust it, do 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 the process of seeking consent like we talked about in the governance episode and and get an answer. But it's some flavor of that. It's generation, it's filtering and sorting and compressing and wordsmithing and finding the truth. And then, and then getting everybody to say, you know what, safe to try, let's go do it. Yeah. And if you're doing this in a strategy context where, you know, you've done a retro of the last quarter and you're figuring out what the next quarter is going to look like, this can be a really good interstitial before you refresh the projects or your backlog that you're going to do. And I think it's one of the few Mm. spots where it doesn't hurt to have a leader potentially weigh in or have some veto power. Like I was in a really great session with someone who's been on this show, who is brilliant. And the even overstatement that bubbled up to the top deprioritized growth. And that person was just like, yeah, we can't, we cannot do that. Like Mm. this quarter, the level of pressure on growth means growth even over like almost anything else, or we're not going to have jobs here. So I think, you know, I, I like having it emerge and be, multiplayer and participatory and particularly in a strategy context i don't think it hurts if you have a leader who's like i have broader context about what might be happening with the board or the parent company or the stock price that is non-negotiable yeah i love that i mean in a traditional system the leader has context usually or information that not everyone has or not at the same level so that's valuable and even in a more progressive or you know sort of startup or or teal context often the founder has some kind of sourceness some vision yes. some sense of where we're going that is intuitively tuned into something that again not everybody has full resonance with and so i think it's okay to be like hey like the reason I created this space or started this party was to manifest something in the world. And, and we need some statements that like serve that in some way, or, you know, or it's become something that's not me. Right. Which is also, I mean, it could be a big moment actually. I think, I think these even over conversations can be transformative for everyone involved, but there are moments where it's like, Oh, maybe this thing has become something that I don't need to be a part of anymore. Yeah. Or maybe it's becoming that, or maybe it just needed to be reminded of what it was. And that's exactly my role is to be like, folks, folks, we started this place to produce the best hamburger, right? right? So we're not going to make the shitty one that you want to make. Right. Like that's not, we can't prioritize that. Right. So there's, I think that's the role founders play. And often when you see the Nordstrom family go back or Howard Schultz go back to Starbucks or Ben and Jerry, like go back to the, to the factory, it's always in service of like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like what what's here? what is natively true about us that we have yeah. to draw back to the center because the thing that's weird about even overstatements and well it's not weird it's true across the entire OS but it's it's uh, poignant is that 
the OS of the world around us is always trying to mess with our priorities. Mm -hmm. And so if you are a publicly traded company for 20 years and the founder looks away to run their basketball team, there's a very high likelihood that they're going to be like, should we switch to one ply toilet paper in the bathrooms? And everybody's like, yeah, Yeah. board approved. (laughs) Because that's what the like broader culture is telling us to do. So I do. Yeah, I think there's that that role of leader in this that's important. Yeah. And the one other sort of use case that I wanted to articulate, because I I think what we've just outlined in terms of strategy and like sort of leader fingerprinted constraining is the most common, but um, I had a really good experience recently generating even overs around our hiring process. Mm, and, yeah. and, you know, we've talked about our hiring process on this show before. The thing that I'm the most proud of in terms of our hiring process is that we have developed it in a truly emergent way. Like we <laughs> have truly held assertions and assumptions lightly and tested and used real data and real experimentation as we go. And very recently, we had gotten through interviewing with a, a bunch of candidates and a bunch of candidates had made it through the application process, through three rounds of interviews, and we had to make some decisions. And it was very murky. You were in some of those conversations. It was very murky. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. And, and what you started to hear was people defaulting to preference or opinion or trying to sort of like conjure data to make <laughs> their case or, or more specifically to just be like, I don't actually feel that strongly about this. So someone else make their case. And, and I'm, I'm giving you all that context because sometimes when they're, when you're in a meeting or you're in a discussion and the decision is not becoming clear and everyone mm-hmm. is making points that seem rational and valid. <laughs> what might be happening is that you need an even overstatement. Right. And what Sharon and I came away with after that was, oh, we have we have coalesced around the skills that we are looking for. But if a bunch of people have tested over the threshold for those skills, we don't have a way then to prioritize between those people. Mm. And so she and I created a list of even overs for the people that we hire. And we actually didn't ask for consent around these because we're the stewards of this process. And we just said, <laughs> this is this is what we're going to try for now. And we're going to see if the people that we hire using these ov- even overs are a bunch of yahoos. And if they are, then we'll change them. But for anybody who wants to come work with Ready, what we landed on was, versatility, even over depth, which addressed some conversation about people being like, this person is an expert in growth. And we were like, who, what, this not, that's not what we're hiring for. The, the even over ready to deploy, even over loads of potential, because we talked to some like diamonds mm-hmm. that people were just like, they could be great. And I'm like, no fixer uppers. So we came to that one <laughs> generative difference, even over existing perspective. So, you know, more divergence, less sameness. And finally, and potentially most controversially given our history, if we are going to choose to develop someone that is not ready to hit the ground running day one, our even over is to develop those with relational strength, even over developing those with intellectual horsepower. And of course, we want both. Everybody wants both empathy and candle power. And Mm -hmm. what we have decided in this moment is if we're going to invest in somebody who is not ready to deploy, we are going to prioritize that and see where that gets mm-hmm. us. And so I only say this and give these really concrete examples because we didn't start our hiring process with these even overs. We're a year in and we've only right. now realized that after we get through this minimal threshold of coherence, there was still a missing rubric through which to prioritize our decisions. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the kind of turtles all the way down aspect of it too, which is like, you could have these and then filter even further with another set of four, right? Like it's how big is the funnel and how deep do we want to specify? And I think like everything in, in org design, it's just enough, right? Yep. So like, you know, just enough clarity, just enough direction, just enough alignment to keep us coherent so that we can maintain our flexibility and our, our freedom and our autonomy, but have a togetherness about it all. So I think the last bit of territory to hit before we close on this first conversation about even overs is the counterintuitive nature of a really good one. 
So we talked about, you know, kind of rule number one is it should work both ways. It should be a positive thing and another positive thing and, and make sense that way. I think the, the sort of rule number two for me is if and when you can, having the statement be something that most of your competition or most of your you know, peers in a space would not recognize as true and important, but turns out to be, yeah. is actually where the rubber meets the road on these things becoming like super impressive and powerful. And so, you know, for a lot of companies, they probably wouldn't have gone completely insane about market share as Amazon did for as long as they did without profit in the public market and survived that. A lot of companies in the hospitality space when Airbnb first came out were like, uh, hospitality, even over feeling like a local is definitely the strategy. And Mm -hmm. Airbnb was like, no, the like feeling connected, feeling authentic and local, even over hospitality, like we don't even have a fresh towel for you. And, and it turned out that, you know, to the tune of many billions of dollars a year, they were, they were right. And so that I think is the, the real magic of this is first, just make your priorities clear, make them, you know, make real trade-offs, make them interesting to you. And then second, look at like how many of the statements we hold at a company level or a unit level or a product level are controversial. And if you have none that are controversial, think about what that means. Because it really means that like strategically you're playing a pretty safe game and you're very unlikely to have an outsized outcome. Right. And this is a perfect way to where you have the sense or where you have like the one divergent wild idea that everybody is kind of jazzed about. This is (laughs) a place to articulate that wild swing for a period of time and see what it gets you if you prioritize the thing nobody else is looking at. Yeah, exactly. And, And I think you can play that game of when you have the spark of an idea, just try to put it in these terms. Mm-hmm. So you say like, oh, I have an idea for a new restaurant. It's going to be so amazing because it's going to do X and Y and Z and whatever. Cool. What are you really saying? What are you actually prioritizing even over something that the rest of the industry already does? And mm-hmm. if you can put it in those terms clearly day one, the power of that idea then for others to like come along for the ride and be like, oh, we don't just you know serve an extra portion because we serve an extra portion. We serve it for a reason. And we have a whole psychology around why that's the trade-off we want to make and why others will be unwilling to make it and why we're uniquely suited to make it and, and, you know, are going to achieve our purpose as a result. Yeah. And those things, when you get, when you see them in the wild, and I would love to hear from people when they have seen those things in the wild, I will try to come up with some more examples myself, but I feel like as a customer, those are the things that will delight you when you just have an experience with an, with a company or a product and nobody else is doing it. And you're just like, Ooh, good for you. That's, that's sparkly. That feels, that feels like (laughs) fresh and brand new. You know, I think a lot of those come from counterintuitive trade-offs that organizations have decided to make. Customer delight seems like a pretty good place to draw things to a close. And it's occurring to me that we don't have explicit, even overstatements for the brave new work podcast. (gasps) And so it might be fun to come up with some and put them in the show notes. Okay. So that's what I'm thinking. And then we'll see what, what listeners have to say about that. I've already got four in my brain. Bam. I'm you're ready. Good at this. I'm ready to do it. <laughs> All right, y'all. If you are liking what you're hearing, please do give us a review. Tell us about your even overstatements. Send us a note to podcast of ready. We love it. Please also share us far and wide. We appreciate it so much. If you could see me right now, you would see that I am tipping my virtual hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good every week. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work. Look into it. And you can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at theready.com. As for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something. Change something.